Most of the time, you will have prepared for direct examination with your retaining attorney. You will know roughly what your attorney will ask, so staying calm during this process should be easy. What you have learned in these lessons thus far will guide you to the best ways to answer questions and to being an effective witness for the side that hired you. You should also consider several other elements in your preparations. Discussing assumptions you made, let's talk about that. Cross-examining attorneys ask questions to determine what assumptions you made during your work. Their intent may be to show that your assumptions were mistaken. More commonly, they will try to introduce doubt about your direct testimony with the suggestion that a small change in an assumption you made might have led to a different opinion or conclusion. If the cross-examining attorney asks you questions about assumptions, he may lead the questioning to reduce confidence in your opinions. If your retaining attorney asks the same or similar questions, he can use this earlier opportunity to ask questions to bolster your opinions by building credibility in your decisions to make certain assumptions. You should have discussed any assumptions you made with your retaining attorney in advance. You should be prepared for a series of questions that address any assumptions at this direct examination phase of the trial. For example, your attorney, he may directly ask you about each assumption you made why you made it, and ask you to explain exactly what trade-offs you considered. Your retaining attorney's questions and your answers can diffuse the effects of the very same set of questions that the cross-examining attorney might ask. During the direct examination, you will be allowed the time and opportunity to provide helpful answers. For example, you might explain at that point your decision to choose criteria that were sensible to you, as well as why you made those choices or assumptions. Perhaps, in your opinion, those assumptions had the greatest support in your scientific literature, or because the assumptions were consistent with the general methodologies used in your industry. Let's talk a little bit more about creating and using demonstrative exhibits. You may try to explain something to the jury that may be complicated enough to require many words. If that's going to be the case, you should have considered in advance the creation of a simple graphic or mock-up to show to the jury. These kinds of exhibits are different from the attachments to your expert report. An exhibit of this nature is generally much larger, so the jurors can easily view it. You should think about creating one exhibit for each major opinion that you offer to the jury. And you should not clutter it with excessive graphical or textual or numeric information. It demonstrates the essence of your opinion in just a few seconds, hence the name demonstrative exhibit. In a trial, a picture is unquestionably worth a thousand words, because so much more rests on your ability to explain the facts. Exhibits of a visual nature become more and more beneficial when the issues and your specialty are more scientific or complicated. Some people learn better from pictures than words or numbers. You should prepare to deliver expert witness testimony in both visual and verbal ways, so the jurors who learn from either way better will understand you. Eye-catching, colorful, and easily understood visual aids will complement the greater detail of your text or tables or spreadsheets. Exhibits do require imagination. If you have that creativity, then conjure up an exhibit that presents your information visually and simply. You should hire somebody else, though, to create the graphic exhibit for you so that you can bring it into court and show it. During the trial preparation, 
you can ask your attorney whether he has resources to create a mock-up or graphic that will help you explain something. You provide the creativity and the direction for the exhibit, and hopefully the attorney should be able to provide the person or people to build or create it for you. You should realize that the jurors may look at your exhibits on their own well after you have personally presented them. The meaning of your exhibits should be evident to the jurors when they look back at them. But a key tactic to know is that you should not rely on live demonstrative exhibits during courtroom testimony. You might be tempted to create a flashy three-dimensional moving exhibit that reconstructs events for the jurors. Unfortunately, though, you just never know when machinery or material in the, in the courtroom may not work or the electricity might go out. Create your exhibit in advance, tape it, videotape it, make a CD of it, then introduce the video as your demonstrative exhibit. The jury can easily review such a video later, whereas they would not be able to reconstruct a live demonstration to review it. Here is your opportunity to explain as well as the best teacher you ever knew. When you present demonstrative exhibits that have been well prepared in advance, you have an opportunity to be active, often, not always, to leave the witness box, to have your voice express your enthusiasm, and to be physically more engaging to the jury. Let your enthusiasm and excitement for the subject matter, your exhibits, and your belief in your results just spill over from you to the jurors. You should not overact, but you should realize the opportunity for a little bit of acting. You should have your demonstrative exhibits covered until you are ready to use them. If they are visible to the jurors before you are ready to discuss them, they will distract the jurors from your earlier testimony. On the other hand, if you do present them, leave them uncovered after you use them during direct testimony. They will continue to affect the jury by being visible. Also, you will be able to refer to them during cross-examination if you wish. A skilled cross-examiner will probably not let you go back to your demonstrative exhibits during his cross-examination. It will be to your benefit if you have oh, neglected to cover them up, and if he has neglected, carelessly, to remove them from the jury's view. When you are in the witness box, in order that everyone in the jury box can hear you, you need to be aware of your voice level when you are using those demonstrative exhibits if you write or draw on some form of display board, you should write both legibly and large. Also, try to not turn your back on the jurors. If you must, stop talking briefly while you write. A tactic to pull away from this, if you have to look over a document at the request of an attorney, do not talk while you are looking at it. When you are ready to talk again, and comment, look up from the document and look over at the jurors. This entire lesson to this point has focused on acting professionally and effectively inside the courtroom. An error that some expert witnesses make is to forget that they have to maintain their professionalism outside the courtroom as well. The court will take breaks and you may find yourself in the hallways, in the bathroom, in the cafeteria, in neighboring restaurants. Anyone within earshot of you may be a juror or a member of the opposing legal team or a member of the court. You should be alert to these possibilities and you should be discreet in what you might say about the case, the client, the strategies, or any of the other people and players in it. Even when you are careful about what you say and where you say it, you will still be at risk. For example, if you are social and you start conversations with people at the water fountain or in the hallway, one of those people you chat with could be a juror. 
A conversation with a juror is a possible error that could cause a mistrial. So you will be much safer to simply not start conversations with anybody you do not know in a courthouse. And if anyone starts a conversation with you, you can certainly be polite, but keep the conversation short and limited to the sports or the weather, but certainly not the trial. Another possibility in a major case is that a member of the press corps might try to interview you, either before or after you testify. Once again, you are safest if you make no comment. A polite response might be to offer your business card, but not to answer questions.